Hi, everybody. Tony Marcolini here. Uh, welcome to it may, it may Interest You to Know. I'm joined by my co-host, Seamus McDonough. And today we have just an extraordinary guest. Uh, I'm, I'm just in awe of him and delighted that he agreed to, uh, uh, to come on to the show today. You'll know him, of course, from MASH, uh, legendary actor, uh, uh, that he created BJ Honeycutt, but he's done a host of other things, producing and been on many other shows, which I hope we can get into all of that today. Um, please, everybody welcome Mike Farrell to the show. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Mike. So I, I want, I mean, I want to get into so many different things with you. I mean, certainly I know you started in the early days with Days of Our Lives, right? Mm -hmm. In the late 60s, when soap operas were somewhat of a new genre, Oh God! Were they were they new then? It was, it was. Uh, yeah, you're right. It was the late '60s. I had been, um, you know, working my way up in the industry as they do. You you do a day on this or a day on that or a one line here or a one line there, and doing plays in uh, in the neighborhood to local theaters to try to get the attention of casting directors and agents and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And the soap was, I guess my first real break in the sense of having a, a an ongoing role in a in an ongoing show what uh, was it like in those early days because i mean i think you're producing content constantly because it's out every day yeah yeah it's a, it's a stretch um you know the, you have a new script every day and you have to uh, come in and to the t if you have the time to read through it and rehearse it and then uh, get it on its feet and go for it and you shoot it um, as if it were live now whether or not it went out live I don't frankly remember but I think I think it what I think it did I think we we as we shot it people saw it and with MASH, I mean, it, it, you came right off of that. I mean, MASH wasn't that far after Days of Our Lives. Am I correct? It was. Let me think. I was on Days of Our Lives probably 68, 69. I did a television uh, series uh, called The Interns in 70. And in 71, I did a show called The Man in the City with Anthony Quinn. Oh, yeah. Uh, at Universal Studio. Um, and that resulted in my being under contract to Universal for uh, a period of time, which I wasn't thrilled about. But the opportunity to work with Tony Quinn was something I couldn't pass up. So I, I, I agreed to it. And I was there for, um, I guess, three years altogether, 72, three, four, um, uh, doing, you know, Universal, when you're under contract, they want you to do all the stuff that they have there. <laughs> and mo much of it was really not particularly interesting to me. Mm -hmm. But I got to work with Marcus Well, with uh, 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 Bob, uh, what was his name? Dr. Marcus Welby. Uh, mm. um, and um, I worked with actually with Jane Wyman on a show, which was very exciting. Uh, oh. Work with her was exciting. I, I wasn't particularly interested in doing the show because it was a sort of a Marcus Welby <laughs> ripoff with her as the Marcus Welby character and me as the Jim Brolin character. Um, and then um, a couple, oh, I did a movie that I liked a lot, a movie for television called Quester. Maybe it was called the Quester Tapes, I guess. It was a Gene Roddenberry project that uh, um, was a lot of fun with uh, Robert Foxworth. Um, that was supposed to be a television series, evidently, once we, you know, once it had been on the air. And there's a whole long, nasty story associated with that. Um, yeah. And then um, my agent got a call saying um, the Wayne Rogers is considering leaving MASH and uh, we'd like to know if Mike would be interested in coming over to, to meet with us. And I, I said, would I? <laughs> <laughs> Can I? It's a question. I'm under contract here. And um, my agent said, well, go have the meeting and, you know, we'll worry about the contract later. So... Um, mm. uh, I had this wonderful meeting with Larry Gelbart and Gene Reynolds and Bert Metcalf, who I knew I'd known because he was in casting at uh, Universal. And um, 
it, it, you know, I was I was a huge fan of the show by that mm. time, and the idea of being part of it was sort of magical. Um, but I was uh, so, and having done you know a lot of work to television series, the soap, a lot of mm. other things, I, I knew I could act, and they knew I could act. But um, doing a show like that is not something you often get an opportunity to even be considered for. So I was, I was really, <laughs> I remember being really nervous in the meeting. And uh, one of the questions they asked me was, or why I asked them <clears throat> was, uh, look, I said, I love the idea of being here. And uh, I know they were very open. They said, um, we, um, you know, we want to keep Wayne here. This is a contract dispute and we don't want him to leave, but in the event he does, we have to be ready to replace him. And that's why we wanted to meet you. And they were meeting other actors as well. And I said, I understood that. And I said, but I'll tell you what, the one um, concern I have is that I wouldn't want to be um, the actor who comes in and, and, and steps into the Trapper John role, just sort of replaces one actor with another. And they said, no, 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 no. Of course, we wouldn't want to do that. In the military, people transfer, people do, you know, all kinds of things happen. So what we have in mind is um, a, a guy who's new to, the, to Korea, who is married and has a child at home and intends to be faithful to his family, wife and family, and not be a womanizer like Hawkeye and, uh, and Trapper mm. were. How do you feel about that? And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> Modeling fidelity on national television? <laughs> Sounds like a hell of a good idea. <laughs> um, and, you know, things happened and, and uh, they asked me to do a test with Alan, not whether to see whether I could act or not, but to see what the chemistry was like. And, and they actually tested two other actors as well. What was that like, your first scene, you know, doing that first test scene with Alan Alda? It was horrifying. <laughs> it was scary. <laughs> you know, you're, you're in a situation, I've see, I'd seen the like situation, but had never been in it. Well, I had been in it. I'd been in the Marines and I'd lived in a tent. So I know what that was like. But, uh, mm. um, but no, you know, I mean, all the nerves come to the fore and... I, I did my best and I guess I did okay. But I remember leaving thinking, God, you stupid fool. You know, this is a, it's supposed to be a comedy. Maybe you could have tried to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I got home and a couple of days later, got the call and. Uh, the rest is history. The world Do changed. Remember, yeah. Do you remember your first day on the set? Sure. Sure, I'll never forget it. Actually, the day I got the call was, um, I'm guessing, a Thursday before the Monday I went to work. That night, or that afternoon, actually, I got a call from Alan asking if I'd have dinner with him. Oh. And I said, oh, God, wow, I'd be thrilled to. And it was the most generous thing. I mean, he was just really remarkable, as he continued to be, just really remarkable. And he... Mm -hmm. We met at a, at a Chinese restaurant in Hollywood and sat up till all hours of the night talking about, mm. from his perspective, what he wanted the show to be, um, how he saw the potential for this new character, um, but just really getting me clear about how dedicated he was to the show and, and everybody in the cast and how they felt, how strongly they felt about the show and the potential for the show. Um, and I was, of course, stupefied and, and thrilled and um, delighted because I'd been in, you know, I'd been part of a, a couple of shows that were one, one of which had a serious intention. And in, in television, you don't get that opportunity much. So um, I was just agog at the idea of getting to know this guy and, and, and have the opportunity to work with him. Um, so when I went to work, um, Monday morning, uh, 
I never forget. I walked in and the first person, I, my fear was that because Wayne was a part of the family. I mean, Wayne was, you know, regular member of the cast for three years. Oh, sure. I thought, God, maybe they're going to hate me. Maybe they're going to think I'm mm -hmm. this uh, interloper who came in to, to break up the family and take mm -hmm. their friend's place and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I walked in and um, first person who walked up to me was Gary Berghoff, Radar, stuck out his hand, said, how are you? My name is Gary. I'm happy to have you here. Um, and then it was, I think, Loretta and then Bill Christopher and uh, Jamie, uh, it, one by one. I mean, it was just really wonderful. Mm -hmm. They were very open, very gracious, very welcoming. And we sat down um, around the table, which was a big new uh, experience for me. I mean, I had done that in the soap. We used to sit around the table and read the script, but not in series television. You really usually didn't have time for that. But we, uh, we did on this show, we sat down and Gene Reynolds, the director, producer, uh, introduced me to everybody and the producers were there and the writers were there and the cast was all part of it. And he said, okay, page one. And we read through the script, which was really a wonderful thing to be able to do in, in moving pictures. You know, you don't often get the chance to rehearse. And the idea was we were going to have a rehearsal day, get up and not only read the script, but then get up and walk through various scenes with the director and the uh, director of photography to, to get a sense of what was, uh, what we might do, how the way it might go. And uh, so I was, yeah, I was like a pig in, you know what, I, I was, <laughs> I was <laughs> delighted. <laughs> At the end of this read through, uh, there may have been applause. I think they, they did that sometimes. Mm -hmm. At the end of it, uh, Gene then said, okay, page one. And we had just done that. So I looked at him kind of confused. And he said, oh, Mike, he said, uh, here's where we go through it page by page to see if anybody has any questions, any problems, any suggestions, any thoughts. And I thought, oh my God, <sighs> these people want to hear from the actors as to whether or not they have thoughts or suggestions or <laughs> I thought I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> and, and that's the way it was for the following for me for the next eight years. It was like being in heaven. Mm. Just, just great. It sounds like heaven, Mike. It sounds like heaven, really. Yeah. Oh boy. It yeah. Was. It was. Yeah. And I'm sure you had, you had the same experience in doing plays. That my my experience is, that is with plays and uh, a little bit of stuff on TV, but plays. It becomes like a family. It's a family, really. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. And and, and unfortunately, I've been in television shows where that wasn't the case. You. <laughs> yeah. The actors didn't, in some cases, didn't even care for each other. Yeah, but, you know, they had their own agenda. Uh, they had their own agendas, and they had their own careers to concern themselves mm -hmm. with, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. This was uh, this was just fabulous. It was, I, I, I'm I'm quite sure a once in a lifetime experience. How much creative control did you have over, you know, B.J. Honeycutt? Well, I wasn't. You know, I was the newbie. I wasn't going to be asserting control, but they did ask my opinion about things. And as we went down the line, it it, it became clear that uh, they really wanted to hear uh, from me. And they were also very savvy about picking up things. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a motorcyclist, so they worked riding motorcycles uh, on a couple of instances into the show. Uh, David Ogden Stiers, when he came to the show, was a music aficionado, particularly classical music, and a conductor. And so they, they made that part of the Winchester character. They were, they were very smart about that. Mm. Um, two things come to mind um, when you ask that question. Um, one was, um, <clears throat> I think in the first year I was there, uh, we did a scene, Alan and I did a scene. Um, the show was about Blythe Danner, the actress was the guest star. 
And the storyline was that he, uh, uh, Hawkeye and Nurse Blythe, had had an affair, had fallen in love and had an affair back stateside when they were in maybe medical school or whatever. And suddenly here she was in the compound. She was temporarily assigned to MASH and she was married, but suddenly, of course, their cords were struck and they were off having <laughs> rekindling their affair. And uh, Hawkeye and BJ Allen and I had this uh, scene in Colonel Potter's office where he said, uh, uh, I haven't been around much anymore. I said, yeah, I know, I've been crying into my pillow. And he said, uh, uh, do, you, uh, do you disapprove? I said, not my place to disapprove. And he said, uh, um, were you ever unfaithful? I said, never. He said, uh, were you ever tempted? I said, tempted's a different question. And he said, aha, so you have been tempted. And I said, <laughs> I didn't say I had been. I said, it was a different question. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a joke, you know, and so we played the scene and, and we went off uh, afterward and um, uh, Larry Gelbart, who had written it, was there and, and Jean, I think, was there watching. And uh, I said, you know, that's a great, uh, it was a great scene. It was wonderful fun and I loved doing it. But I said, just as a thought, if BJ is never tempted, then I don't think fidelity sort of has any meaning. If he's tempted and has, and then he's faithful, then you've got, you've got something. And they said, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And the next season, they came back to me and they said, uh, what would you think about BJ falling off the fidelity wagon? Mm -hmm. And I said, wow. Um, mm -hmm. I said, that's a tough one, but it really depends to me on how you resolve it. Mm. They said, okay. And they went back to the drawing room and they came up with, the, uh, I think they called it Hanky Panky, I'm not sure. But the show where BJ and the nurse, he was, a nurse got a, a Dear Jane letter and she was really having a tough time. And somebody mentioned to BJ that she needed somebody to talk to her and we talked. And then there was this sort of kinship feeling of losing not being in touch with one's loved ones. And then there was an embrace and a kiss and we know where it went from there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the show, the, the, the climax of the show was about BJ intending to write a letter to Peg explaining what had happened. And Hawkeye saying, are you nuts? Why do you want to visit that on your wife? Why, why do you want to, why do you want to do yeah. that? Yeah. And uh, I said, I've got to, I got, have to be honest with her. I got to tell her. And he said, tear it up, throw it away, forget you did it, learn from it and move on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that you, you just think, thank your lucky stars for mm -hmm. having been allowed to be in a situation like that where you're doing, sh you're doing stories, you're acting in, in things, but talking about things that affect people's lives and mm. talking about them in as positive and as meaningful and as helpful a way as you can. Mm. So, so mm. yes, I, I, had, I had some uh, abilities. I was allowed some opportunity to really um, help, help develop who the character was. Mm. Uh, and they, a, they had, another, I'm sorry, you have a question. Go ahead. I was just going to say that you did this, a similar uh, storyline with Susan St. James, did you not? There was a, that was a whole different thing. Yeah, Susan uh, came, uh, Susan and I did a movie together in the off uh, period and she said, God, I'd love to do your show. And I said, geez, I just said to the guys, uh, Susan St. James wants to do the show. Um, wouldn't it be great to have a, to have a show where, uh, you know, some, this woman comes on, this uh, attractive woman comes on, and that happened to Hawkeye all the time. I said, well, how about a show where this woman comes in and Hawkeye gives her the big rush and she says, um, she looks past Hawkeye and says, Who, who's the quiet guy? <laughs> and, and that developed into this huge, colossal, uh, 
crush between BJ and and uh, and uh, Aggie O'Shea was her name. <laughs> And it was, uh, you know, it was very, well, BJ was nuts. He just could gone off, could, got, got, got off his kilter and, um, and finally got back on it and said, look, I can't do this. This is, I'm, I've got a lifeline uh, at home that I can't uh, jeopardize and this isn't going to happen. Um, so that was, that was another, you know, really, really fun, interesting Tough show to do, but but uh, it stretched the character. Uh, mm -hmm. a lot. I, I really loved doing that. <laughs> there, there was another one where uh, we were sitting around the table and we had talked about this. Uh, we, a lot of stuff we did came out of research where uh, 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 they had studied, uh, uh, contacted doctors excuse me, and nurses and, and patients who had been in the MASH situation in Korea and in Vietnam. And um, this particular thing came out, of, um, came out of that experience where there was a gung-ho officer. We were getting a lot of young kids who were wounded and there was, they, were, they were beefing about their commanding officer who was sending them into a very, very dangerous situation trying to take a particular hill or something. And uh, he came to the set, he came to the swamp, uh, to the to compound, to rouse up the troops and say, come on, boys, I need you to come back. We need to go, you know, go get the enemy. And Hawkeye and BJ looked at each other and said, we're going to take this guy out. We've got to, uh, let's invite him into the swamp. We'll give him a Mickey. We'll tell him he's got appendicitis. We'll operate on him, take out his appendix. And... Um, get him off the line for a while so he's not killing some you know arranging for the killing of so many of our of our troops because he was just too gung-ho and too uh, ready to send young kids into their uh, to their death but he was of course behind the lines so we got to the end of the reading and we were talking about then hawkeye and pj go in and they do this surgery and uh, on this guy and I said, I, I got a problem with this. And they said, what's that? And I said, BJ wouldn't do this. And they said, hey, whoa, whoa. This, is, this came out of, the, out of the research. People actually did it. I said, I'm not arguing that it wasn't done. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying Hawkeye wouldn't do it. And Alan said, yeah, Hawkeye would. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it's just the BJ character that I know that you're, you and I are building here wouldn't do that. It wouldn't cut into an, uh, you know, uh, cut into a healthy body because there are risks you take when you go into surgery, and mm -hmm. it's not, it's against everything that he stands for. And we had a probably a half hour conversation, kind of debate about that. And Bert Metcalf, who was our uh, producer at the time, I think exec producer, probably said god he said you know we got a better story here than we do on the script so let's <laughs> we'll rework it and that's what they did they they changed it so that at the end of the of the escapade when they got the guy sick hawkeye said let's go and bj said you're not seriously going to do this <laughs> said, i am and bj said not me man i can't do that and uh, he said okay and he went in himself and he came back and, and they made it, see, they made it as they would want to do. They made it into a, a, a lesson for people. Um, Hawkeye came back into the swamp. BJ said, how to go? He said, perfectly healthy, uh, red, nicely uh, formed appendix. He'll be out for a while. And then we heard the choppers and radar said, choppers, more wounded are coming. And the point was, no value was had from the from mm. that, from that drastic action. Mm. Wow. So you know, we kept. I, I, I was thrilled with the fact that we kept trying to do things in the show that 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 said things about human life and about the value thereof and about caring for people and about the stupidity in some instances of. Uh, sort of dogmatic authoritarianism. All the things we talk about today. Sure. <laughs>
I mean, mm. did you feel any um, obligation to, rem had you read the book? I should start there. Had you read the book before you started on the show? I don't, I read the book. I don't remember if it was before I started on the show or not. Um, and if the answer question was about it, any um, obligation to the character or the characters, there was no BJ in the book. Um, the answer is no. Dr. Hornberger, uh, who wrote under the name Hooker, um, was not a fan of our show. He was. He said it was too left wing and too anti war for him. He was. Uh, he was pretty much a conservative uh, mm. um, type. And uh, although I talked to his later years after he passed away, I talked to his either his niece or his daughter. I've forgotten which. And she said, you know, he he really grudgingly thought it was a good show. He just, <laughs> he just didn't like the fact that you guys were anti-war. And I said, well, tough. <laughs> well, I mean, some of the best scenes that I think are, are on the show are the, the group scenes. Um, you know, when you're all doing something together uh, and all getting involved in the in the in the mix, how much fun was that? I mean, because I, I know that you filmed somewhere on location. Am I right? Like you were literally in in like the middle of the trenches, kind of. Uh, you weren't in a studio. Well, we were in a studio for much of it. Yeah, they had recreated. Yeah, we had they had recreated the compound on the stage, and we um, we had the swamp and the OR on the stage, and we had a number of other things. We, we could bring a jeep and that sort of thing. But if you needed a tank or if you needed the helicopter or if you needed to go um, get have a big vista in the shot, then we were out at the ranch in um, what was then the 20th Century Fox Ranch out in Malibu, Malibu Mountains. Um, and we were out there probably one day per show. Um, uh, <laughs> and inevitably, <laughs> we always said when it, whenever it was the coldest day in California, we would be playing hot Korean summers and we were, <laughs> we were wearing uh, uh, Hawaiian shirts and they had to spray us with, which is like we were sweating. <laughs> and the reverse was of course the case. Whenever it was the, mm. the hottest day out there, we were all bundled mm. up in things. Mm. It was a Korean winter. Mm. It was, uh, which sounds, sounds like my uh, uh, invitation to jump in here. I live in San Francisco, the coldest, <laughs> the coldest <laughs> winter. Oh, yeah. the, yes, you, the coldest winter I ever had is this, uh, cold, coldest winter I ever had is the summer in San Francisco, as a, uh, <laughs> whoever said that. So fascinated by, by all of this. And, 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 I, and, and I know I, I'm in the field of recovery. And, and we'll just go back a little bit here about, uh, about, um, uh, am amends so okay how do we start this out? so it's all lessons and then that's what I got from MASH and I love this it's just a lessons for life and how to live life and all, and all that and um, how, how have you two come together to do this show oh we went to college together back in oh, the yeah. day St. John's University yeah. together yeah. Were, you, were, you fighting? were you fighting at the time I was fighting, you know. I, I actually start, I, I won the I won the Golden Gloves in New York the, for my first semester at St. John's, and and uh, yeah, and then uh, turn pro and and uh, if purpose is everything in life, that this just I have the, all these little philosophies about how I live my life, and purpose is everything. Like, why am I doing what I'm doing right now? So we're on this show, we're on the, doing this show, and and uh, we're interviewing you, Mike, which is so great, and I've been a fan my whole life. Ever since I can remember, <laughs> and, and uh, you are my favorite character on the show, <laughs> Thank you. And, and all that, all that. But um, what was my question? <laughs> it's gone. Okay. It's gone. Right. Well, right. I mean, I, I actually, if I could, there's just a few other. I, I mean, I, I was talking about the, the group scenes that you did, and it was just such a show of camaraderie. Um, I felt like it was real. I felt like you all really enjoyed each other's company and there wasn't any acting. What? Well, I mean, there was acting. I mean, like, now that you were forced, it didn't seem forced that you were forced to like uh, each other. No, we, we, we actually grew to love each other uh, and continue to this day. I, I was just on a Zoom uh, yesterday with Jamie and Gary and um, Loretta and... Um, wow. Barbara Christopher, Bill's gone now, Bill Christopher's 
wife, the father Mulcahy, um, uh, we were uh, discussing something. Uh, we do that all the time. We're, we've stayed very close and have regretted the loss of, you know, so many of our comrades, but we were, it was, it was, a, how, how do I say, we, we worked hard, long hours every day, five days a week. And then Saturday night, we'd get our, our uh, significant others and go out to dinner together, all of us. So it was a, it was a, a, a loving um, pact of people, group of people. It was just a, a wonderful organization and a wonderful company to be part of. You ultimately started writing episodes too. Didn't you write maybe four or five episodes for the show? Yeah, they, um, it became, and it kind of for, foretold that with the story I told you about the, at the beginning about the asking the actors if they had any comments, any suggestions. Quite often, uh, somebody would say, you know, this, this is a great joke, but it worked better maybe if, if Bill said it or if, I mean, Father Mulcahy. Uh, I mean, actors were being generous in their willingness to step back and let somebody else come forward. Um, and it, it, that, again, was, was new to me. Um, so it, it, it was, we were encouraged to be part of the, um, the creative process. And I, I began to think of it as a creative community. One time I came to the set and Bert was there, Bert Metcalf, the executive director, executive producer, who did a lot of the directing as well. He said, I said, hey, Bert, I got an idea for a show. And I told him what the idea was. And it was based on the tortoise and the hare kind of concept. And he said, uh, that's a great idea. Why don't you write it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, uh, well, <laughs> Uh, you know, I had done some writing, but when I was under contract at Universal, I, I wrote a couple things, but mm. I thought, man, this, the writing of this show is crackerjack, and I'm not sure I'm up to that, mm. but I'll give it a crack, you know, I'll give it a try, mm. and I did, and of course, then you're pulled into the writer's room, mm. where, where the staff sits around, and they'll say, well, what about this, and maybe we could try this, and what do you think of this, and I mean, they were very generous in terms of going with my story, but they were really quick to come up with some wonderful gags that I never would have thought of. So yes, I wrote it, but I wrote the core and was part of the process of writing it. Mm. And once you do it, then you do it again and you do it again. I, I wrote, uh, I don't remember, four or five. Mm. Um, and again, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> I remember... <laughs> I remember, and I directed then, I said to Bert one time, I said, you know, I've been watching and paying attention and I'd like to try my hand at directing. He said, it's time, mm -hmm. absolutely. So I was directing, then I directed a number of the shows as well, but I was directing one, I remember, that I had written. And it was uh, Alan and Harry and probably David Stiers in the, uh, in the, uh, pre-op room where they were getting ready to go in and do the surgeries and they were making some jokes with each other and I, I had set up the shot and I was looking at it through the camera and I thought to myself god damn man I don't, I don't you, they don't have to say anything this shot tells the whole thing who wrote this shit <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you, it's, it's, it's a fabulous learning experience to be in a situation mm. like that where they give you the opportunity to make a mistake or um, learn how to do it right. Mm. What about the finale? Oh, oh. the finale was, um, well, it was, it was genius on Alan's part. Alan wrote most of it. Alan and Bert had something to do with it as well, I think. Alan and Bert co-directed it, I think. Anyway, um, in year 10, Alan and I were doing a scene together and I said, how long do you expect this to go on? And he said, I thought, I always thought about 10 years to do it. And here we were in year 10, my seventh year, but year 10. And uh, I said, 
we had given uh, part of the con the relationship that had developed that you mentioned. Um, we used to the 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 crew built us a little hut on the set where our chairs were, and between scenes we'd go in and sit down, and we'd just shoot the bull about life and about life, our lives and loves and politics, a lot of politics, and. Um, the show and you know scripts of course um <clears throat> but at any rate i said i think we ought to have a the conversation with the group about this and we sat down with them and alan and i said you know we've been talking about the possibility of bringing this show to an end my own feeling was i don't want it to i, I don't want to ride the horse downhill mm -hmm. i don't want it to become a kind of repetition of what what happens with comedies and they had it's it's always a little bit of a slur to call it a comedy because MASH was so much more than that. But mm. um, Larry Gelbart said, "This is not a sitcom. This is this is a a, a, a dramedy or something." Mm. But at any rate, uh, I said, "I you don't want uh, too many shows sort of cheapen themselves on the way toward ex non-existence." where some network executive says, oh, ho hum, it's time to pull the plug. Mm -hmm. I said, we're riding high here. We are at the top of the ratings, the, the extraordinary, I mean, extraordinary reaction that we were getting to the show, which is a whole other story. Um, you know, we really need to take a look at whether we want to end the show. And one, one of the things we need to end the show is an end of the show episode. So we argued and went back and forth about it for days. And then finally all came to the conclusion that yes, we would do one more season or one more partial season. It turned out because there was a strike involved and it meant there would only be, I think 11 or 12 episodes. So we had agreed to the studio that we would do one more season and that was gonna be it. But we wanted to have an end of the show episode. Mm. and uh <laughs> that was like throwing a hand grenade into the into the works because the studio didn't want to end the show and the mm. network didn't want to end the show mm. um but we said tough this is it for us and um when they finally kind of got got it that we weren't going to do any more of them they said well you can't have an end of the war episode and we said that's crazy. Of course, we can end it, have an end of the war episode. And we all, they said, we're going to send somebody down and explain to you. And uh, we, <laughs> we were sitting in our little hut and this executive came in and he said, folks, I understand you want an end of the war episode. Here's the problem. Do you remember The Fugitive? Sure. The television show that I David Johnson. One arms guy. <laughs> one arms, right. Well, David Johnson decided he wanted to end the show. And the way he wanted to end the show was to find the catch the one armed man and prove the doctor or whatever his name was, wasn't the victim, wasn't the killer. That guy was. And bingo, it's resolved. And we said, yeah, of course we remember the fugitive. And he said, well, David wanted to end it that way to resolve the show, the story. And it killed the show in syndication. Now, syndication is the big way studios make a huge amount of money selling the show to repeat and repeat and repeat for 40, 50 years now. Um, and, uh, and we said, uh, I, I remember we looked at him and, and I said, um, you know, it might surprise you to know that most people know the Korean War ended. <laughs> 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 he, yeah. he, got, he looked at us for a minute and then he got up and walked out of the room <laughs> and came back and they said well you can't have an end of the war episode but you can have a two-hour movie mm. end of the war. and yeah. their thought was that they could keep that movie sort of from repeating mm. very often so that it'll keep the, the string of the show running Excuse me, I get teary-eyed talking about it all. Yeah. And um, and uh, uh, it ended up being a two and a half hour movie because we had a disaster out there. There was a big fire at the out at the ranch and uh, 
we incorporated that into the uh, mm. into the story. Mm. But Alan, um, Alan, who is a genius, um, came up with this idea for the through line of the of the goodbye, which was, I think, the hardest acting I've ever done was to say goodbye to those people. Mm. Because even though I knew we were going to see each other again, we mm. would never see each other under those circumstances again. Mm. Anyway, Alan came up with this idea that the war has to cost something. It cost, if you look at the story, you realize it cost Hawkeye's sanity. It cost um, uh, Steyer's uh, Major Winchester, his music. It cost Father Mulcahy his, uh, his hearing. Uh, it, it, they were just, they, they were so choice and so thoughtful and sensitive and, and um, I thought uh, deep reaching in the way they dealt with everybody on the show that uh, it was uh, some, of the, some of the hardest work any of us have ever done. Bert Metcalf, who directed a particular scene said, I've never been in a situation I've had to act or ask actors not to cry so much. <laughs> we were all saying goodbye to each other in character, but we were mm -hmm. saying goodbye as friends. We knew we'd never see each other under these circumstances again. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we'd never, you know, have the same opportunity. We did a, we did a, the, the last day of shooting, uh, was was on another episode. We had we had, we'd had to shoot the movie um, before we ended the, sh the the production season because they needed more time to do the post production on it. So we had one episode that we finished be as the last episode after we shot the movie. And um, at the end of that that day, the set was jammed with photographers and news cameras and journalists from all over the world paying attention to the fact that this show was going off the air. Mm -hmm. And it was afterward, they had us uh, had a press conference and each of us was asked to say some things and answer some questions. And I'll never forget, uh, Harry Morgan got up and uh, he said, I've done, I don't, I don't know how many it was, 30 some television series and 14, 15 historic television motion picture, 25, I don't know. Harry was in every, every classic movie you ever look at. And he said, I've never done any work like this with people this talented. And somebody said, uh, one of the reporters said, has it made you a better actor? And he said, for, he thought for a second, he said, I don't know about that, but it's made me a better human being. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. good there. Yeah. Beautiful. Wow. Well, and I mean, that, I remember watching the finale. I actually remember watching the finale when it, when it happened, not just watching it in reruns. And it was huge. I mean, I don't think anybody, I think you, you probably have the record for Nielsen ratings, I think, for, oh, yeah. for yeah. that episode. Yeah. Uh, the, the only thing that beats us is the uh, the final football game. What do you call it? The Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, is the, only thing that, the points higher, but no no television show has yeah. ever beaten us. And it it, it, it Alan, <laughs> Alan came in with the news uh, after the or gave us the news afterward. He said in New York City the uh, Department of Water and Power said. <laughs> <laughs> they could tell how many people were watching it because uh, during the commercials, toilets flushed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I was I was in Ireland at the time, and it was the event of the of the of the year. And yeah. The end, yeah, totally okay. amazing. Yeah, and in my mind, I tell you, I, I know that I remember the last scene with uh, Hawkeye and. Um, uh, Loretta Swift's character, Hot Lips, right? They, yeah. they have this really big moment, like this big kiss at the very end. You're all kind yeah. of awkwardly standing there. <laughs> and, right. and for me, in my mind, they wound up together. Like somehow when they got back to the States in years, oh, they found each other again. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. In my I mind, I always felt like they belonged together. And I guess I was hoping that that's how it would end. But really, I guess it ended as it should have. You were just together you know, bonded together forever from this moment in your lives, which would be true of any uh, group of people who serve together in the military going through some traumatic moment together, right? right. It's, it's, you're, you're forever bonded in that moment. Uh, and sometimes it, it is intended to be just what it is, this moment in time that lives forever with you, but doesn't continue. I think that's the way we uh, made it to, to end with just that, with this knowledge. People have always, because BJ said, you know, I'll see you, I'll see you again, we'll get together. Um, people have always asked, do they get together? I said, in my mind, yes. <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, there's never, there's never going to be a Hawkeye and a BJ getting together. It's a, mm. like an Allen getting together at some time. Mm. Can I just say also that in, in fighting, I was a professional. I was a professional boxer and all that. I fought Holyfield and all that stuff, and for, I was a boxer for twenty years. And when the career ends, there's actually a phenomenon in the medical books called professional athlete syndrome (PAS). It's like how do you how do you recapture those moments, the training, the the dressing room, the the lights, mm -hmm. the, the the prestige, yeah. and it's it actually it actually can have a, a really detrimental effect on people's lives, you know, trying to recapture that stuff. And I find it the same, with, I, I, not just for sports, but I know for acting, it must be the same. Uh, it's like people talk about the good old days. How do you recapture? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, yeah. we have that in common, you know, and, and uh, yeah, I, Tony knows my big thing is that I'm 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 reco recovered alcoholic now. And I haven't drank in over 25 years, okay. and uh, I had to find some way to deal. I had to find some way to solve my problems and not have to drink. Uh -huh. So yeah, and and what what I've what I've been doing now for uh, 25 and a half years is I do the 12 steps every day. I did them this morning when I woke up, and that yeah. that resolves it all for me. It it uh, yeah yeah. No, that's great. My, I've got a lot of that in, in my family, a lot of alcoholism. And, uh, and I was part of a halfway house organization in the 60s, uh, working with people who were drug addicts, alcoholics, people out of mental institutions, out of prisons, mm -hmm. what have you. Mm -hmm. So I, I have some understanding of what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. And in my business, you're right. In my business, there's the kind of the, <clears throat> the, the has-been aspect um, or the never were. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the ones who, ones who wanted to be but never that's got me it. probably <laughs> um but why, I, you know why, each of, i'm sorry go ahead i was just gonna say how come you guys never did a reunion movie uh, or something where you brought the characters back and had them get together in the states for something a, a crisis a health crisis for one of you and you all kind of get together you never bring us back like mayberry right when we all went back to mayberry <laughs> and revisited how come that never came about it never came about because i think that we all felt that that would cheapen it that we left it at a moment of uh really a, a premier moment and that somehow you can't go back you know it, that it to do so would be a disappointment and in my experience some of those mm, get together movies get together uh, experiences are a little bit too much a little bit a little bit of a disappointment well, I so, think you were the right one, I think, sir, because... Yeah, it, you know, um, a, a lot of people, I must say, a lot of people write me and said, when are you guys going to get together? Why don't you guys get together? You should do a reunion show. And we did. A, I produced, actually, a 30th anniversary uh, reunion, but it was, it was just us sitting around talking about the show. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a theatrical experience in the sense of a scripted story. Um, and next february will be the 50th anniversary of the show so i suspect there will be some kind of mm. Um, mm. tribute to the show being done that'll i would assume involve us those of us who are still around um but but I, I, it, it just felt to me like it was uh, and, and i think i think i speak for everybody else that it was it was it was tasty the way we left it and that's the way it should stay 
beautiful. And on another, on another note, uh, so you produced Patch Adams with Robin Williams. I did, I did indeed, yeah. And how was that experience? Well, the experience of move, making the movie was awful, um, but uh, uh, I, I love Patch. I, um, my wife and I were part of a um, peace delegation to uh, the then Soviet Union in 1985. Um, and it was put together by a guy who wanted people from all walks of life to go into the Soviet Union, which was then, according to Ronald Reagan, the evil empire, mm. and um, do a kind of people-to-people -people, um, process meeting and interchange exchanging ideas with people. And um, we, we met in Helsinki, uh, Finland, before we went into the Soviet Union. And... Uh, we were treated to a lot of people who were part of this thing, many of whom were uh, new age types. And they had, you know, God bless them, they had very, very clear views of how you communicate with people, but they were not always the, 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 the usual <laughs> way. Mm. And um, we went into a few of these meetings and I began to think, whoa, man, we're going in with, into this place and these people are in the Soviet Union are not going to be too excited about some of this. Anyway, we were walked into this big meeting and uh, I was looking around and here's this guy. He's six foot, six inches tall. He's wearing a clown hat, big shoes, floppy pants. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, if these people are from outer space, this guy's from Pluto. <laughs> what are we going to do? And then we got in and we sat down and then a couple of people spoke and then this woman got up and she was very much at the new age. And she said, I have brought with me some very powerful crystals. And I want each of you who uh, resonate uh, to each of you who, who is, is moved to do so come up and I have a bag of these crystals come up, find a crystal with, with which you resonate and hold it close to your heart when you go into the Soviet Union if you find someone with whom you have a real connection share mm. that crystal and there will be a bond between you and I thought okay <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this guy got up and it's the guy I was just describing the, the hat mm. floppy hat plot big shoes etc and he said I'm a doctor and I believe that laughter is the best medicine I want to found a uh, uh, a uh, free hospital. And he said, and I have brought with me <laughs> a bag of powerful rubber noses. <laughs> I want each of you who is so moved to come up and take a rubber nose <laughs> with which you resonate and put it on your nose. And <laughs> when you go into the Soviet Union, if you find a, a, someone with whom you connect, share that rubber nose with them and your life will their lives will be changed. Well, I thought, uh, I love this guy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who he is, but I love this guy. Yay! <laughs> and he did this perfect parody of the woman with the, and I thought, oh God. So we got on the train to go in and uh, we were stopped at the border and there was a very serious group of uh, mm. soldiers, uh, Soviets, who came in through our, and wanted to check our baggage. Mm. I was bringing some stuff in from Amnesty International that they wouldn't want to me to bring in. Some people were Christians who were bringing in literature, Christ Bibles and stuff that they wouldn't want to be brought in if they found it. And I looked out the window and there was Patch up and going up and down the line of a bunch of these guys, armed soldiers, giving each of them rubber noses. <laughs> And I thought, I thought, oh my! I, I have to, I have to know this man. So, during our time in the Soviet Union, we were there for a couple of weeks, and we got to know each other and had dinner together a lot. And he's, he's just a remarkable, remarkable mm. human being. Mm. And over time, we stayed in touch. Um, uh, that was eighty-five, so that was probably four or five years before, uh, no, four years before um, he called me and he said, Mike, I've written this book and it's gotten some attention and some people from Hollywood want to make a movie out of it. 
And they brought me out there and they picked me up in a limousine and they took me to big restaurants. And he said, these are not my people. I don't want to talk to these guys. He said, mm -hmm. if you, if you, it, 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 I want you to make my movie. And I said, Patch, I don't have the um, clout in the industry to get a movie made uh, that you're talking about. Um, but if you, uh, but if you, you know, hang in with some of these people, you know, big folks, they could really make a, make a big movie. Nope. He said, I want you to do it. So I said, I'll try. So I went to Universal where I, my wife was doing a show at the time. And I knew the producer of the show was also had a movie deal. And I talked to him about Patch and I said, read this introduction to his book and it's crazy i mean it's really nuts but it's wonderful and it would make a, a great movie um and he took it to universal and they said okay yeah wow. we want to make this movie so that started a, a long and painful process um they finally brought in a director that i thought was wrong we brought in a writer who we've quickly learned was wrong the writer and the director got together and they sort of took over the movie. Um, and they made a movie that made a lot of money, but it wasn't the movie I wanted to make. It, mm. it, it, it showed, you know, people laughed. It, Robin Williams is a brilliant actor. Um, oh, sure. um, and it, it, you know, he got a lot of the funny stuff, but they didn't get into the, the guts of who Patch was. Mm. His mm. Patch continues to be. And, mm. uh, and I apologized to him after we, I said, Patch, I'm sorry. We didn't make the movie we wanted to make. He said, Mike, you've made me a world renowned doctor. He said, I am invited to speak all over the world now. And I can talk about my philosophy, my medical philosophy. Mm. And I'm hoping that the movies, the, the gates <laughs> of the movie will help me build my free hospital, mm. which sadly it did not. The studio made all the money and Patch didn't. Mm. So it's it's a it's a it's a cautionary tale about movies. Uh, you can mm. have the best of intentions and uh, and not actually realize what you want. Mm. Patch is a patch. Patch is the kind of guy who, when you sit down at a table in a restaurant and the waiter comes up and says, "Hi, my name is Mark. I'm your ser server." Before that, Patch would say, "Hi, what's your name?" And the, per, the safe server would say his or her name, and Patch would introduce everybody <laughs> around the to the. I mean, he's a. I love that. He, he's he's a he's a real loving, open, happy human being. He said, "I get up every day, and I say today is going to be a wonderful day." And then he makes it that. Mm -hmm. It's 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 really remarkable. Mm -hmm. I wish I wish some of that had gotten more of that had gotten through well it's still an amazing project it was still a great movie um not exactly what you wanted to nope. make but still part nope. of uh uh yeah, there made, made made universal studio 400 million dollars yeah it and was still very big <laughs> and very big but it, you know the fact that they didn't kick in enough money to make his hospital uh it's just not fair it's yeah not mm -hmm. is, that them, a dream? is that a dream he's still pursuing yeah, he's still pursuing patch goes he's what he started doing is clown trips he goes to he went to then the soviet union he went to russia goes to russia a lot he goes to central south and central america uh with uh with and it, it, he's turned it into a really positive thing with uh, by taking uh, Vietnam vets who are suffering from PTSD and in mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in therapy. Uh, these vet vets go with him, and he gets them to dress up and doll up and mm -hmm. and, and and clown for the kids. Mm -hmm. Makes a change in their lives as well mm -hmm. as in the kids' lives. So it's. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really an extraordinary thing. I just actually talked to him mm. a couple of weeks ago. He's, he's, he's just, just a remarkable man. Mm. 
Well, I mean, I, I hope that the fundraising continues to actually make that hospital happen. I hope so too. I hope so too. But I would love to, to, talk, to talk to him and get involved in it also. I would love to. Okay. No, I'd yeah. be happy to put you in touch. Thank you. Sure. Send me, uh, send me an email or a, a phone number or something and I'll, I'll put you in touch with him. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Sure. And I, your wife just stopped by, so I would be remiss <laughs> if I didn't talk about. Of course, you're married to the beautiful Shelly Fabrice, yes. And uh, you know who? Oh boy! I mean, girl, happy and uh, one day at a time, <laughs> and coach, yeah. and you know, yeah, so many different you know worthy projects through the years. Uh, but you two got together, although briefly, professionally, didn't you both do some voice actor work in Superman or? Uh, something like that, right? You played Martha and uh, played, Jonathan we, Kent. That's right. We played Ma and Pa Kent. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? Oh, it's it's just fun. You know, it's a, it's a trip to be able to do. I, I don't do a whole lot of voiceover work, but they asked us to do it. And I thought there was a, that was a great thing. And we, we actually were in a movie together. A, a movie oh, I didn't I know. Used. What movie were you in? Uh, it's called Memorial Day. It's um, the first um, movie I co-produced, television movie I co-produced. Um, and it's about the first, um, it's actually the first really, I think, good dramatic uh, explication of PTSD. It's about a Vietnam vet who sort of went to pieces um, and how he, he got kind of traced it back to and experience in Vietnam. Uh, it's a, I think, a terrific film. Um, mm. CBS didn't put it on, but they didn't give it the the, the support. I think it could have mm. really made a difference. What and I've had like? a lot of vets had a lot of vets contact me about having seen it and uh, talked about how how meaningful it was for them. What was it like working with your wife? Oh, it's wonderful. She's great. You know, she's a, just the sweetest woman you ever want to know. We, we, we actually worked sort of technically when we met on the interns. I mentioned I had done a television series right, after the right. show. Uh, I did, it was the interns show with Broderick Crawford. And where I played one of five young interns, I was the married one and there were four others. And um, Shelley had a guest role on that show. Um, and she said, uh, you know, we, we said hello to each other. We didn't know that, <laughs> that was it. She was married. I was married. And I was, I was carrying around my, uh, my son's, my baby son's picture. So she said, all I remember about you was that you wanted everybody to see the picture, <laughs> the brand new baby boy. Uh, Aww. so then we, uh, I was under contract at Universal. I bumped into her a couple of times there. And um, by 1980, when my wife and I split up, uh, it turned out she and her husband had split up. I hadn't known that. Um, and we got together. We, we were, oh, uh, you, more than you want to know, I suppose. But No, I'm fascinated. We, th they used to do what they call... Um, affiliates dinners where before each new season the television networks would bring um, executives from the various stations around the country to a place and they would then show up with um, uh, actors from some of the shows and I had been um, asked to be there for MASH and Shelley was asked to be there for uh, one day at a time and I had just come back from my first experience in Central America, which was a pretty rough. Uh, I was there in refugee camps and more than you probably have time to hear about now. But I was, I was pretty rocked from the experience. I had been in Southeast Asia and Cambodia uh, the year before, but then two years before, but then there in 82. And I walked into, and then I promised to be there. So I went to San Francisco for this thing, this affiliates dinner, and walked into this room where all the celebrities were. And it was not the world I wanted to be part of right then. I didn't want to be in Celebrityville. I didn't want to be telling stories about my, my, my 
television career. And I walked across the room and I saw this woman and I walked over to her and tapped her on the shoulder. And I said, I'd just like you to know that every time I see you, I get the nicest feeling. Wow. And she said, well, how sweet of you and da, 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 da. And then we were called to go into the dinner and they wanted to introduce us. So we lined up uh, alphabetically. So she was Fabre and I'm Farrell. We were right, she was right in front of me. And she said, um, I said, what, what's your, uh, what are you doing tonight? She said, my big, my big, my, my big goal tonight is I want to meet um, Arthur, um, what, what, what was, my brain dead now. The big newscaster that was so famous for his. Walter Cronkite? Walter Cronkite. I want to meet Walter Cronkite. And uh, I said, well, uh, uh, good luck, you know. So <laughs> we, went down, we were introduced and I went and sat at a table and chatted some people up and she sat at another table. And when the evening was over, we were walking out and we just happened to bump into each other. I said, did you get a chance to meet Walter Cronkite? And she said, no. She said, I met one other guy, but I didn't meet him. And I said, well, I'm tall. Maybe I can find him for you. And we looked around for a little bit and didn't. He'd already left. But we walked out of the hotel together. It's in San Francisco at the top of the hill. And a cable car came up the hill. And I said, would you like to take a cable car ride? And she hesitated <laughs> for a moment. And then she said, sure. And we got over and got into the cable car and took a ride and down to Fisherman's Wharf. And we walked around. And I just unburdened myself. I told her about this horrific experience or this experience I'd had in Central America. And um, she was so gracious. She talked about this guy she was dating, this doctor she was dating and her how much she loved, loved his two daughters. And we walked back to the hotel together and um, I said, good night. And um, the next morning they gave us a, uh, they we came down and the, they had arranged cars for each of us to go back to the hotel and they put Shelly and I in the same limo to go back to the hotel to, to go back to the airport I'm sorry so we flew back we went back to the airport and then we got seats together we sat together we talked <clears throat> and um, she said if you ever uh, uh, oh I said you know I'm I, I do a lecture on this she said something about this trip I'd been on and it might do her boyfriend some good to hear about it. And I said, well, I do a, a speak about it periodically and um, we'll show some slides about some of the things I'd seen. I said, if you'd like to come, I'm doing one, I'll call you and I'm doing one. And she said, oh, okay. And then I called and she said, I'm sorry, we can't, I, whatever. But she said, but if you ever do one again, let me know. So God, it's two or three months later I got, was requested to do another one of these things. And I called, I said, you said to, to let you know. So I'm just wanting to let you know, you and your, your boyfriend can, they're welcome to come. And she called me back and she said, uh, is it okay if I come and bring my sister? <laughs> You're opening. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> and that, uh, that, after that evening, we went for coffee with her sister and then, after that, we had dinner and the rest is history. 37 years late of marriage later. Wow. Yeah. What a great story. Yes. Yeah, it was. Well, you yeah. make you make such a wonderful couple. I mean, and well, thank you. Yeah, so she's a, she is she is truly the sweetest woman I've ever known. And that comes across. There's a true gentleness in, in her in her mannerisms. Yes, I agree. I agree. So a couple, just a couple more questions. I know I've already kept you way over, but if I could just throw in a couple of quick questions. Listen, I'm, it's your, yours. I'm, I'm here for the, for the duration. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to talk to you too about, you had done some de work on Desperate Housewives, right? Which oh, yeah. was, a very, which was a very, you know, popular show uh, in its time. Uh, and so unlike, I hate to say so unlike you, but I mean, so many of your characters were meaty. 
yeah. right? You're so uh, meaningful, impactful, just different than, than you know, <laughs> the <laughs> Desperate Housewives. So what drew you to that character? Oh, well, it was a job. They, you know, it was a number of weeks on a show that was it was a hit uh, I, I wasn't i'd never seen the show so i had no oh. idea um but um i knew um i got to know uh eva longoria because i played a character i, I guess my son was her mm, either husband or love interest i've forgotten now but uh, she and I played a number of scenes together. She's really a peach. She's really a nice, nice woman. I, I, I have a great deal of regard for her. And um, and there's another woman on the show whose name always I have trouble with. I want to say Liberty, but I'm not sure. Was it, it was Terry Hatcher and uh, Nicolette Sheridan. Yeah, you're doing you're doing a good job. The other one. <laughs> <laughs> One. The one I can't remember either. Yeah, okay. she, she just she just gotten so she's married to Bill Macy and she oh uh, she got in some trouble sure yeah she got in yeah. some trouble about the college, college. entrance thing I can't but she's that. a tremendously tremendously talented actress and um, and really a nice woman and I was so sorry to see that she got into that uh, got into that uh, problem. Um, but you know, people make mistakes. Oh, agreed. Absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. That's what humanity is all about. Indeed, yeah. Um, but but it, so, so desperate housewives was a you know was a, was a job. And you did another show though, Province, right? That was a, a long Providence was fun. Providence. Providence was five years, yeah. I. Uh, how did that uh, compare to being on MASH? I mean, uh, well, you know, everybody wanted to ask that question too, but I, I, I had, it was 16 years from the time I left MASH to the time I did Providence. And, and I had no particular interest in being in another sh series because um, MASH was the end all be all for me. Um, but my agent said, these people want to want to send you this script and, uh, and see what you think. And I got uh, got the script and I read it and I called her and I said, uh, this is too good to be on television. It'll never make it. And she said, well, they think it will. So what, would you be interested in meeting them? And I said, yeah, sure. So I met um, with Melina uh, Kanakaridis, who was the star of the show. Um, and she's another just wonderful person, just a terrific young woman, smart, talented, you know, there, there are a lot of, how should I say, <laughs> not so great people. <laughs> in <the business. laughs> well put. Um, so, so when you meet the nice ones, when you meet, meet the really solid ones, you, you, you want to hang on to them. And she was, uh, she was ready to go with this show. And it was a, a, a you know, very interesting show. And I thought, eh, it's okay. Why not? And I got to play a veterinarian, a good, fun character, a guy who was, had animals hanging around him all the time, and mm -hmm. the father of these three young people who, uh, she was a doctor, the young daughter, middle daughter, uh, uh, played by Paula Kale, was a, uh, uh, a kind of ne'er-do-well with pregnant and not yet married, <laughs> and uh, and this young, youngest one, Seth, was a uh, uh, kid who always thought he was going to strike it rich anytime <laughs> he turned around, and he never did. Um, so we had a good time. It was a good, it was a fun show to do. Um, I worked on it for five years, and they were very, uh, they were very generous with me because um, that's the period of time when my wife had. Uh, um, mm, medical emergency i guess you'll say she had to have a liver transplant yeah oh, and they were uh, they were boy they were just as supportive and mm. i had to wear a pager uh all the time because when 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 you gonna have a transplant you have to have you have to be ready to go and you can't be more than four hours away from the hospital at any one time mm. and i told them that i said if, if this thing goes off i'm i'm out of here and they mm. were too they were great um, and in fact, the uh, 
assistant director who would take my pager and he'd wear it when I was shooting a scene. He'd wear the pager and let me know if it uh, if it got had to go off. So we went through that. We went through the the transplant. We went through the recovery and during that period, and then uh, um, and now we're two uh, uh, has been. <laughs> oh, far from it. Far from it. You have both. I mean, honestly, Hollywood yeah. royalty. Well, she, thank you. She she really hasn't any interest in working anymore. Uh, she said, you know, she's done it since she was three years old. She said, I, I just don't want to do it anymore. I love to work, and and periodically I do a, I do a show or a play or whatever. But uh, mm. you know, they don't want all us gray-haired guys, white-haired guys uh, mm. around all the time. Well, if we, if we ever make my movie, if it ever happens. You are, uh, you could play my manager. You'd be perfect. Just, <laughs> he's a great to. guy. Nick, Nick, Nick <laughs> Baffy, great guy. You would be amazing in the part. <laughs> well, I mean, they have a question that you're probably not going to know the answer to, though, because <laughs> they probably presented it to you this way. But I have to know when you first got the script for MASH, and they, usually I know they give you some element of a synopsis or a series Bible or something, uh, you know, it's talking about your character. Did BJ have a real name? Did BJ stand for something? Or is it just like in that whole episode you do where BJ doesn't stand for anything? <laughs> what is about your parents' initials? I mean, was there really a name when it was first presented and that storyline came up later? If, if uh, well, be no, if, truth be known, uh, the um, director of photography on the show was uh, named BJ. His name was BJ, uh, Billy, Billy, Billy Jurgensen. And everybody called him BJ. So mm. that's where BJ came from. Um, mm. The, uh, what they, they, they had that episode where Hawkeye, everybody was crazed about finding out what does BJ stand for? Mm. And I think <laughs> at the end of the episode, they had me say, my mother was B and my father was J. Um, but I always say, I, I love the, the line because people, always ask me what does bj stand for and my answer is anything you like <laughs> <laughs> <You're right on. laughs> i was always curious because sometimes i know they put a lot of backstory into you know a series bible or when they you know first give you materials on your character that don't even always make it into the uh, into a show right it's just kind of to set the mindset for the person as to the, who you are coming in and i always wondered like did, is there was there a name <laughs> <laughs> no bj well other than bj billy jurgensen um but um there was no you know there was no bible for bj because they didn't even know bj was going to be necessary when they started the series uh, and uh i just i just got very lucky when wayne decided he uh it wasn't it wasn't enough for him mm. did you Whatever. ever meet wayne rogers after that had you come in you know time? i met him one time i will never forget it um we were we I walked into an event of some sort, some sort of political thing. Um, sometimes we actors get involved in these things. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw him standing down in the aisle. So I walked down and stood beside him for a while and looked over and he looked over at me and he said, I'm getting real tired of people thinking I'm you. <laughs> and I said, I get the same problem, pal. <laughs> and he, we chatted for a while. He was very sweet. And he said, I got to tell you something. He said, I met Elliot Gould once. And Elliot Gould said, are you playing me? Elliot Gould did the movie. Uh, yeah. Play Trapper played, in the movie. Yeah. Play Trapper in the movie. And uh, Elliot said, are you playing me or are you playing the other guy? And he, and um uh, Wayne said, I'm playing you. And Elliot said, I liked me better. <laughs> and Wayne, Wayne said, I tell you that, Mike, because I want you to know I like you better. Wow. What a compliment. Wasn't it? Wow. That was really a generous thing. Wow. To do. Yeah. Well, was, that's a lovely was, compliment. I was really yeah. knocked down. So you yeah. had to feel that. I mean, I would think that burden I and mean, because Wayne Rogers I mean played played a very good trapper I mean he was oh, great yeah. oh and yeah so coming into that I mean I would think 
you had to feel the, that sense of nerves coming into that role. Big time, big time. Uh, you know, I knew there were going to be comparisons and there was nothing I could do about it, but I just wanted to make sure that the character I created or helped create was, uh, it worked. And, and, and the big te test was the beginning of the new season of the fourth season. Mm. And you watch the ratings and you see if the ratings go into the toilet, I'm going to be the guy that wore a mash around his neck for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, mm. they no, they weren't. Your character is beloved. Um, mm. You know, the, 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 the jokester, certainly, but the, the kind of humor you brought to the, to the role, I think. Um, it, it, I think of you like a Bob Newhart. Um, <laughs> oh, you know. Thanks. You definitely brought that understated uh, comedy to the role, where you just had these great, just uh, observational, you know, uh, thoughts, one-liners. That this uh, soft spoken is also to you and to to your brand of comedy, which I thought really worked in Thank the you. role. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there was uh, ratings-wise, certainly there was no dip. There was no difference really i mean and and your character went on but i think he did creatively such a good job because I, I had read some stories um that you guys did have some level of creative control with your characters uh that they were very open to these little nuances uh that you'd bring to your own characters or to uh storylines uh and i thought gee I mean, you created such a beloved character. Uh, I mean, and that's, you know, that's a process, right? From yeah. beginning, from accepting that role to where you ended that role, you had developed so many different sides, I thought, and nuances to BJ. And that's another reason I, I really love, I love talking to creative people because I know, you know, writers, of, of course, I love talking to writers, they create these characters, but then the actors bring them to life, don't you? Um, you know, you give no, that's our job, yeah. <laughs> you, you give them all the extra things that really don't go on the paper uh, and couldn't possibly, you know, get on the papers and, and into the scripts. So to your credit, I mean, you really seamlessly, uh, you know, went into the man into the man show. And I think you did a beautiful job creating a very beloved character. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, I have to say it was an honor to be there and it is an honor to have been there. I, uh, it, it was, it's odd to say about a job, about a television show, but it was one of the most important experiences of my life. Mm. And, and, and it was because I, so many, I learned so many things, not just about acting and directing and writing and that sort of thing, but so many lessons from the reaction of people. Mm. I've, I've been literally all over the world and um, in some fairly tight situations and seen people's, um, from, from, from places you'd least expect it, seen people's reaction to the show and to the character, my character or other characters, uh, seen how meaningful it was to them it has been and and, and remains um i mean that sort of thing <laughs> it's just a story i've told before but uh, one year i was doing a i was invited to do a telethon in michigan for some charity and i was doing my part and uh, there was a break and they said uh, you're free to you know go outside get a breath of fresh air, whatever you like. And I walked uh, down the street in Green Bay. No, not Green Bay. Oh, it was, it was Wisconsin, Green Bay, Wisconsin. And uh, walked down the street. And as I was walking down the street, there was a guy coming toward me. And as he got up to me, he stopped and he said, hey, and stuck out his hand and said, how the hell are you? <laughs> I said, I'm fine. I grabbed his hand, shook his hand. I said, I'm fine. How the hell are you? <laughs> and then he stepped back all of a sudden. He said, oh, my God, I just realized I don't know you. <laughs> and I, I laughed and I said, well, uh, th there was a very sweet greeting nonetheless. Thank you. And he said, 
how does it feel to have half a relationship formed with millions and millions of people? <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's something to ponder. <laughs> Yeah, because we all feel like we know you, but obviously we, we don't. Uh, but we all feel like we had this attachment, uh, mm. you know, based upon years and years of growing to love your character. Mm. And you're yeah. not really VJ, right? We understand you're Mike Farrell. You're not really yeah. that person, but but still, you come into people's homes. Sure. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, it's an amazing opportunity to have had. And I, I might quickly say, like back to Patch Adams. Yeah, uh, with with laughter and 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 uh, according to Thoreau and Emerson, the number one measure of success in life is to laugh often. Ah, yeah, uh -huh. both. Indeed. Yeah, Thoreau and Emerson both. Yeah, both yeah. of them. Yeah, oh, top, they, they had a top ten list like Dave Letterman. <laughs> <laughs> No, last question, I promise. Do you have, and I'm sure you've gotten this through the years so many times, but I, I'm going to ask anyway. Do you have an all-time favorite moment or favorite episode of MASH that's forever with you? Well, the whole experience will never leave me, but um, I think the best show we ever did uh, was the interview, the black and white half-hour Edward R. Murrow-esque show oh, where yeah. the camera crew comes in and he interviews each of us for, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I, I think it's just one of the best half hours that was ever on television, but two, um, the, the, the writers write their brains out in a season and they were asked to do 24, 25 episodes. And this one year, um, Gene came and he said, they've asked us to do another episode and we are uh, beating our heads against the wall mm. um so we've come up with this idea here's a piece of paper of a pad with a list of questions and he gave one to me and one to each member of the cast and said now i want you to answer these questions in character like, like improv like, almost like an improv right exactly mm. and then they took those answers to these questions back and wrote a script where this guy came in and asked us questions. So we, we, we effectively wrote our own script for mm -hmm. part of that. And then there would be questions that we weren't given that he would ask and we had to extemporize. Um, so it was, it was at once uh, one of the great um, gifts to give us in terms of their belief that we had the capacity to really maintain these characters and and do them justice um and two it was just a whole lot of fun you know to be <laughs> able to uh, to be able to do that and some of the things that that arose from it um i'll never forget bill christopher who was one of my dearest friends until he passed um he, father mulcahy he, he said a line about when it's sometimes when it's very cold and a surgeon cuts into the body and steam rises from the incision and the surgeon warms his hands over the steam how can one not be moved by that okay <laughs> okay mm. uh. Yeah, you know, I, I saw that episode in a rerun just last week. Did you really? I did. Yeah, great. It's a yeah. wonderful episode. And it yeah. is, I like, like some of them, I know you didn't always run the laugh track, like in, certainly in the operating room, there was never a, a laugh Yeah, well, track. that was the fight. You know, we, we fought uh, with the CVS because they insisted on the laugh track. Mm -hmm. So we said, you know, uh, we said, you, we, you don't want to do it, we, we won't do it, blah, 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 blah. And they always won. And then we finally said, it's not appropriate in the, in, the, um, in the OR. And they said, well, you're right. Okay, you can take it out of the OR. <laughs> then they wrote an episode that was all in the OR. <laughs> <laughs> but thank well, you. Thank you so much for sharing that scene with us, uh, Mike. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that was a, it was a beautiful episode. And again, it's run, I think, completely without a laugh track. It's very powerful. 
Yeah. Um, it's a great episode. I, well, you were part of something that will live on. It, it, you're a legendary actor. Um, we so appreciate you coming to spend a little time with us here today and to talk to us. We're in, both in awe. We were super excited. I almost couldn't sleep last night knowing you were going to oh, be here today. Sweet. Well, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure. I enjoy talking to you. And I love the fact that people, you and others, love the show and want to talk about it. And um, it's, a, it's a great, uh, great honor for me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time and being here today. Um, again, I, I hope that uh, maybe you'll come back again someday. And maybe we could have like a reunion, like get you all back on the show. <laughs> Absolutely. No yes, and thank you so, Mike, thank you so much. So great to meet you. Thank you. Talk thank to you, you and just hear your stories. Amazing. Thank you. Don't forget you. Thank you. You're welcome. Don't forget to send me your contact information and I'll I will. get it off the page. I will. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Take care of that. Thank you from all of us here at It May Interest You to Know. Bye. Bye. Bye.